All right, we are moving along to our final content area for this workshop. So our last two talks are going to be focusing on prevention intervention. And one of them, one of the people is here in the flesh, Dennis Embry, and his close colleague, Tony Bidlin, who was also supposed to give a talk, but was ill. I think it's amazing <coughs> that we're with you, with you, we only lost one participant to swine flu. I think that that's yeah. like, like yeah, a miracle. Almost. You know, yeah. almost two. So, so Tony actually, we're going to hear a tape record. Tony made a video of his talk. So we're going to hear, hear Dennis, and then we're going to see a, a video of Tony. So, Dennis? OK, let me just get my timer here to go. So I'm going to talk about euthanasia, which is the conscious and <coughs> unconscious policies and practices that are uh, killing our kids or making them ill. And we have been talking about that all day. That's a word we've made up to be sticky in the minds of uh, the general public to talk about what we might need to do. And I'm going to lead into prevention policies and intervention practices that might be possible. In talking about this, I want to emphasize my values. My core values are that every person of every age is entitled and should have access to powerful prevention strategies and tools that would better their lives. That might mean a parent, that might mean a child or youth, it might mean a person who owns a business, uh, it might mean an agency or an organization. Now when I say access, that doesn't mean I'm going to tell you what to do. That means that you have the right and the ability to find the information that would help you. Because a lot of what we have been talking about today, while it is scientific knowledge, it is not at all accessible <coughs> to any living human being. There is no evidence-based prevention program on the National Registry of Effective Programs, Policies, and Practices that is commercially available through Amazon.com. That means it doesn't exist. That is the largest bookstore in the world. <laughs> now, risk is an adaptive issue that most of us have talked about. We all have to take risks. Sometimes we do it for fun. Sometimes we start a business like I have several times. I've been in business on my own since I was 14. That takes a risk-taking thing. It takes risk to move to a new land, to migrate. It takes risk to decide I'm going to try something new, a new food, or go to a college or a place that I've never been before. So risk is not necessarily bad. Now I want to walk you through a series of slides that we have shown to virtually 10, 15,000 people. Now I've cut them short, but I ask people to go true or false, and I'd like for you to replicate this. ADHD, conduct disorders, and personality disorders are increasing. True or false? True, okay. It's true, and everyone in the general public notices this. Younger kids are committing more serious crimes. True or false? True. true. And everyone in the general public notices this. Rates of obesity in youth have increased dramatically. True or false? True. And the general public notices that. Child learning disabilities and developmental disorders have dramatically increased. True or false? True. It is true. Maybe there's a little overdiagnosis of autism, but the rest of it is increasing. Diabetes, asthma, high blood pressure, and other diseases have skyrocketed among uh, our youth and children. True or false? True. That's what everybody says as well. And serious addictions are happening at a younger age. True or false? True. That's what the general public says. Now, all of those things are connected by the same basic core developmental neurobiology that we have been talking about, the same evolutionary risk factors, the same things, all of those, plus some things that we have not talked about. Now we have largely limited our discussion to more proximal things and not also looked, cast a wider eye for what we might need to do for prevention policy and practice. And I'd like to look at why this is happening and what we might do. And I'm going to have a, I have a shorthand that I call this. If the hypothesis is what I'd say is a sort of evolutionary inflammatory process. And here's what I mean by that. <laughs> 
So when you see, I like to do tricks. So uh, <laughs> this is a little Venn diagram of the, what the word inflammation means. I mean, it reads redness, rubor. I love the word rubor. rubor a response to body tissue to injury or irritation characterized by pain, swelling, and redness. Excitation, excitement, fervor, fervor for a state of being emotionally aroused and worked up. Inflaming arousal to violent emotion. That's been proximal about what we have been talking about. And then firing, ignition, and kindling, and lighting. And that means essentially setting in motion the conditions, the antecedents in which some of these behaviors might occur. Now, I want to review for you that there, uh, we, as early on that we talked about the fact that the principal predator of human beings uh, outside of single-celled <coughs> organisms are two-legged organisms, and the principal source of safety for human beings outside of uh, well, sorry, are uh, other humans. And that's because other humans can also help you deal with this uh, as well. So we have a whole issue here of an evolutionary adaptive response that's simplified, that's a generalized inflammatory response, a localized inflammatory response, and anti-inflammatory regulators. And we also have over here an intergroup affiliation and an intragroup cooperation, which are anti-inflammatory and cooperative in nature. But we also have outgroup and uh, other things of threat attributional bias. Ken Dodge's work, for example, about the work uh, of, uh, I just went hostile blind. Attribution bias. Yeah, hostile attribution, but uh, the guy we were just talking about. Nesbitt? Nesbitt. Nesbitt, yeah. Uh, outgroup aggression and tit for tat behaviors that we see in the prisoner's dilemma game. And all of these, both of these, have effects on neurohormones, which was elegantly pointed out yesterday. Now, we didn't talk about how these affect the neurohormones, but those are essentially bidirectional in what they do to folks. And again, yesterday, we talked about the evolutionary path of a child's life, which would be uh, the K path, which is the probability of long life and reproductive success, and the probability of a short life and doubtful reproductive success, which is the R path. And humans are susceptible to that. And the inflammatory processes are all interacting with those generalized issues, I think. So the R path or risky adolescence embraces all of these issues. Now I'd like to walk how this is happening in society and across the board in both the physiological issues and the behavioral issues. We have four major sort of what I'd call ecological causes of the dual inflammatory responses to children and youth. The physiological ones, which I'm going to cover, antecedents, structural antecedents in society, reinforcement differentials, and verbal relations, which are languaging how we frame things actually determines behavior. More on this in a bit. Now these create a multi-inflammatory threat reaction by humans, which is conscious and unconscious. And it has effects on a variety of behavioral and cognitive uh, things related to motor skills, mood stability, attention, reward delay, executive function, behavioral competence, immune healing functions. And it also then affects a bunch of measurable things that are highly costly in human society. Uh, special ed, school failure, cancer, obesity, work problems, substance abuse, mental illness, early sex, STDs. These are all the things when Pete was up at the state legislature had to deal with. Now, I'd like to talk just briefly about one example of the physiological adaptation. In evolution, we arose in the Rift Valley in Africa. We did not arise by eating savanna animals. Our brain did not arise. It arose from eating fish. Essentially, low tide water, uh, tilapia, carp, mollusk, and other kinds of things high in omega-3. Our brain is 30%, 33% omega-3 fatty acids, particularly in the prefrontal cortex. It's what makes our brain operate quickly. It's what's enabled us to have social cognition and intelligence. The first tools that were ever invented uh, are clearly made for prying open mollusk and other kinds of things. It reinforced cooperation because this was not a hunting thing. This was uh, sort of mutuality. Children, women, and uh, uh, men could do this. We also see this in neonates. 
to, uh, in, human infants are the only land-based terrestrial mammal or animal that has subcutaneous fat. And that fat, when that baby is born, depending on how well the mother made, uh, ate, has 60 days of an omega-3 called DHA, which is absolutely essential for the baby's uh, uh, neural development. If a baby and a mom do not have adequate things, even in the modern world, in the study by The Lancet, for example, if mothers eat two servings of oily fish per day in a sample of 13,000 moms and per, uh, infants followed longitudinally into the 13th year of life, by age eight, if you don't eat fish at, during pregnancy, 15% of the children will grow up to have developmental disorders. Oh, sorry, 32% will grow up. But if you, sorry, I said that wrong. If you don't eat fish, 32% will grow up to have developmental disorders and behavioral problems. If you eat fish, only 15% will uh, have developmental disorders. Uh, by the way, I got to share that uh, document with the former um, Surgeon General because the, current, uh, the former occupants of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue did not want um, anyone to know about that study. Can I get Did you say eating fish two times per day? Two per week. Two per week. Two per week. Two per, <laughs> two per week. <laughs> two per week. <laughs> okay. Breast milk has been changing dramatically in the ratio of omega-3s and omega-6s. Omega-6s are found in soybean oil, cottonseed oil, etc., and they are pro-inflammatory. Omega-3 is anti-inflammatory. I cannot go into the, uh, all the details of the physiology. But that breast milk has changed in American infants compared to other countries. This is a multi-country uh, analysis. This is our country. And that means now that most mother's milk is highly saturated with omega-6s, not omega-3s, which is bad for babies. Uh, now the risk behaviors, almost all adolescent risky behaviors have now been documented to be related to low uh, omega-3, N3, and high N6 in the U.S. diet change in the last 50 years. It is so, and let me show you how persuasive it is and pervasive it is. This is the graph from my colleagues, Dr. Joseph Heblin, who was the chief of the, of the uh, Molecular Membrane Laboratory at the National Institutes of Health. This is the huge increase in soybean consumption uh, beginning in the, about the early 50s. And then this is some of the other oils. We didn't used to eat it at all. This just is one of the epigraphs that shows the, and this graph shows the association between homicide risk in the United States of America and rate and the consumption of N6 or omega-6 fatty acid in our diet. This graph has been repeated for something like 18 countries. And when you provide actual supplementation for violent felony offenders, you will reduce <laughs> violent felony offenses by 37% for the cost of 19 cents a day, which is the largest, most impactful randomized control group study on reducing violent felony offenses in all of experimental literature, and it has been replicated. Uh, this is the impact of uh, young people take with depression taking omega-3 fatty acid supplementation versus uh, a, uh, with monotherapy versus a placebo, and you can see the risk reduction. Uh, on that, this is the a meta-analysis published by the archive by the American Psychiatric Association as a unanimous consensus recommendation that all psychiatric patients should receive not less than one full gram of omega-3 fatty acid per day, and folks with mood disorder should receive up to nine full grams per day. This is the meta-analysis on the various uh, depressive symptomatology. The effect size is 0.54. That's not bad. That's actually better than most of the psychotropics. Um, now, that's just one. That hasn't even been on our discussion. But we have to think about evolutionary context in a very broad way because now that is something that we could affect by a policy quite quickly. Um, evolution. This is the antecedent movement and inflammatory, anti-inflammatory things. Mother Nature wired us to walk or run five to ten times per day in the pursuit of reinforcers, which has a long history in humans. And so if we moved, uh, ten to, uh, 5 to 10 miles per day. We also generated brain-derived neural factor, or BDNF. And BDNF is essential for when you earn a reward by your own effort. And who was it who talked about the effort? You talked about the effort of rats, right? The, the illusion of control? Yes. Okay, the illusion of control. If you don't pull the levers to make the reinforcer happen, you don't learn. 
And BDNF is essential for the wiring of the dopamine receptor sites to click in and go, wow, this is important. I can make that happen. And uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time why I think this evolved as an evolutionary thing. Now, the built environment is altering the rates of physical movement of children and adolescents. And Jose Sapoznik, who is at the University of Miami, has done a wonderful study showing that children in Miami living in mixed environments versus control, you know, very pl plain, uh, plain uh, residential environments. Uh, if they're living in a mixed environment, they have better grades and reduced conduct problems in schools. And if you think about it, what they're doing is they're walking more, they're interacting more with other people in a social context, etc. And there are other sort of uh, replications of the idea of a built environment affecting physical movement and then behavior. I was quoting, for example, uh, the use of cooperative and collaborative games in the structured environment. What is a mixed environment? A mixed environment is businesses, apartments, re single residence houses, sidewalks are very important in all of this. And of course, by zoning ordinance, we have generally eliminated sidewalks in most residential areas. So it turns out your child is safer in a mixed environment than a single family residence environment. Play diet. Uh, children, American children have dramatically changed their play from outdoor play, imaginative play, free play, multi-age play, and rough and tumble play to solo screen time. And the effect of this cannot be underestimated and it has happened so rapidly. It has basically happened since 1990. In 1990, only 5% of households had a television in a child's bedroom. By 1995, 26% of households had a television in a child's pre preschool child's bedroom. 38% of households with elementary school children had a television in a child's bedroom. And 60% of households with adolescents had a television in that bedroom. And there is no scientific evidence whatsoever that placing a television in a child's bedroom is beneficial. In fact, there are a few studies that are ambivalent, but most are it's not good. It's kind of like having Chucky as a babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you're not only not getting physical activity, but you're not uh, learning to read social cues. You're not getting to exercise your strategies of the sort of uh, by, what did you call it again? By strategic. By strategic, yes. Uh, and all you're learning is aggression because all of the things that are modeled on there are the warrior myth run amok. Plato was right. Be, care be wary of the storyteller. Now, risky behavior. This change in play is associated with an increase of most DSM-4 disorders plus many behavioral and academic that problems. language works in an experimental laboratory with relational frame theory. Now, when you go to read that, as uh, David and I know, that book is about the densest thing on the entire planet uh, to understand. But the example of the Peace Builder study uh, uses, uses relational frames. I am a peace builder. I promise to praise people, to give up uh, put downs to seek wise people as advisors and friends, to notice and speak up about hurts, and to right wrongs and to offer help. And now with uh, AJ's comment, defend others, I would add, I promise to build peace at home, at school and community. Now there's a group identity, there are group behaviors and standards inside of that controlling the behavior. Friend or foe, simply giving people different group names and colors of clothing will increase verbal and physical aggression in children. That is the robber's cave experiment. Okay, and that has been basically replicated many times, but giving transcendent goals and new names gets people to cooperate and collaborate. Now think how much we are now increasing verbal friends and foes across the entire country. We have a daily verbal diet of friends and foes with the children and so, and so now that is actually increasing of us not cooperating and using instrumental aggression uh, et cetera, or disassociation. Across when, the yes? Across the entire planet. planet. Across the entire planet. <laughs> That's happening. Thanks to Rupert Murdoch. So when language of connection, civility, and belonging are introduced to children and youth, risky behaviors decline in controlled experiments. That is our Peace Builders study. And there are other replications of similar such things. Now, reinforcement adaptation. Uh, we are apparently unique in the ability to use arbitrary sounds and symbols to reinforce behavior. So think about it. A gold star, good job, <laughs> means something socially significant and we have some pretty good evidence that they change dopamine levels. 
and they certainly influence long, both short-term and long-term behavior of children and adults. Now those are arbitrary, and a simple three-term algebra formula predicts whether risky behavior or non-risky behavior in the human world and real-world settings related to differential, verbal, and social behaviors actually predicts all of these risk behaviors. I'm going to show that to you. It's called the matching law. And our reinforcement uh, diet for adolescents, adults, and children today is dramatically deficient in recognition of prosociality. It mostly recognizes aggression and other problematic behaviors or accidentally reinforces negative non-coping behaviors. And clearly upsetting the matching law. When children uh, receive differential rates of peer and adult reinforcement for prosociality, virtually all of the risk behaviors decline. Now, I'm going to also show you, you need to reinforce not. Thank you for not engaging in a risky behavior as well. Um, let me give you an example of the matching law. So Billy is sitting in the classroom like this. What's his reinforcer? Maybe the teacher's going to say, good job, right? Might happen once an hour or something like that. But now, Billy is sitting in his desk chair and he starts to go like this. <laughs> now, what was my reinforcer now? What happened in the room? Yeah, people laughed. And the teacher's likely to say what? Don't do it. Don't do it. Put your feet down, etc. And how many of you took Psych 1? <laughs> What's going to happen to my behavior? And I'm going to do more on task or more of this? More of this behavior. Act. That's both peer and uh, negative peer attention and negative adult attention. And we fail to account for what's happening amongst the peers in most of our modeling of this for why we have differential rates of risky, dangerous, antisocial behavior versus prosocial. We keep telling the teachers they just need to uh, reinforce children more, and parents, we tell them they need to reinforce each other. But the density of reinforcement is for these other showing off status-driven behaviors. This is the simplified matching law. Uh, and uh, Richard Herenstein is most famous for publishing this paper in 1970 in JAB, and it is one of the most cited papers, but certainly not widely as read as it ought to be. And what I just demonstrated to you was basically the matching law of the frequency of behavior will be determined by an asymptotic constant times the rate of reinforcement for the, this target behavior, which was paying attention in this instance. Well, I got one maybe reinforcer. We'll give it that. And then the, this same number plus the rate of reinforcement for everything else in the environment, which was? giggling and laughing and negative peer attention. So that will add to this and divide it into that will make the probability of me paying attention in a classroom negligible. Now, there are multiple studies on the matching law. It predicts basically the pathways of the action of dopamine agonists, of neural dendritic branching, of foraging behavior of animals in uh, uh, the world, of parent-teacher interactions in the classroom, or sorry, uh, teacher-child interactions in the classroom, performance in the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. And it is affected by the K, the constant, the asymptotic constant. Let me illustrate what that means. So if I tell the teacher, you need to praise uh, Tony more often for uh, paying attention. So I come over here and I say, good job, Tony. And the people says, praise him more often. Good job, Tony. Good job, Tony. Good job, Tony. Good job, Tony. Good job, good job, good job. Good job. So you're now, you know, you're reaching asymptote very quickly. So that is, that rate of reinforcement for RP is not as elastic as people think it is. It gets, it's like the speed of light. The closer you get to the speed of light, the harder it is to get there. And this can be influenced. Drugs, for example, methylphenidate affects the K in all of this. <laughs> so that that makes whatever reinforcer just happened to have in the environment. And by the way, this formula is completely neutral to whatever the damn behavior is. It just will predict whatever the frequency of, and choice of behaviors will be. And then this can be affected by uh, reinforcements, obviously, antecedents. 
So if I give Tony a job to help out in the classroom, I will, he will now get differential reinforcement for being a helper, and I won't have to, he won't get as much RV. Uh, relational frame uh, things like, is that what a peace builder would do? That would be an example, and again, the RV can be. Uh, by the way, school uniforms affect the RV. So we have risk ahead. What can we do to help avoid all of these problems? Well, we could do some nurturing policies and practices for anti-inflammatory responses. We could turn on the self-control and the anti-inflammatory response and turn off the inflammatory response. Policies for universal access to parenting skills. I'm going to present that. Every parent, by I think our value, collective value, should have access for, what was that about? It just said I needed to do backup. Well, I'm not going to do that right now. Thank you. Resume slideshow. OK. I'm going to show you about that. Then policies for universal access support for teachers so that every teacher could have simple things. And changing institutional food policy so that school lunches, we just came back from a big event at the National Institutes of Health on providing uh, changing the diet of military service members by changing, using the same recipes but substituting omega-6 fed chickens with omega-3 fed chickens and eggs, which would dramatically affect force management in the military services, reduce PTSD, uh, the severity of injuries to trauma. Okay, told me I'm about done. And community reinforcement policies, uh, community child and youth policies. So what this means is by increasing community levels of reinforcement for prosociality and for not, for not doing bad things, you can actually alter some of these trajectories. And by community child and youth policies and opportunities, I may skip that one, then a consumer model for prevention science. Some of this comes from uh, the recent Institute of Medicine report on behavioral vaccines for change. Now, behavioral vaccines is a concept I published in 2002, which means a repeated behavioral intervention like hand washing reduces mortality and morbidity. And things like having structured, <coughs> organized play reduces mortality and morbidity from risk behaviors. So this is the study of providing universal support for parenting at a population level called the Triple P, which stands for Positive Parenting Program. Universal Triple P with messages uh, on the radio and the newspapers. These uh, levels two and three are very brief advice things provided to parents uh, at the pediatrician's office, at the local school, by, the, uh, by their pastors, youth pastors, preschool teachers, public health nurses, et cetera. Typically 20 to 45 minute things. This was not heavily laced intensive parenting for bad parents who live in, this in <coughs> such and such a neighborhood. This was made universally accessible. About 25% of all families in the, uh, out of the 18 counties, nine were randomly assigned, actually participated. Uh, this is an estimator. If you go on our website, it will calculate, since this is a population level study, we've created an estimator to show for any given state what the impact of this would be. And I just came back from Massachusetts on Friday, so I put this one up there. This is Massachusetts. They would say they have uh, 800,000 kids 0 to 9, 23,000 cases of maltreatment, 3,500 of out-of-home place, placements. It would reduce the number of kids with substantiated child maltreatment by 3,300. Uh, at $9,000 per and case of substantiated child maltreatment, that saves the state of Massachusetts $30 million, which is about one half of the startup and one quarter of the ongoing cost. This is out-of-home placement, would save 900 kids uh, from out-of-home placement, $19 million at $22,000 per child. The state of Massachusetts is actually about $44,000 for out-of-home placement, so that would be closer to $40 million. This is conduct disorders, uh, what the uh, rate savings of conduct disorders. It would save 2,584 children per year from lifetime conduct disorders. And the lifetime cost of conduct disorders is $1.4 million. <laughs> by Cohen's updated study. That would say the state of Massachusetts uh, accrual over time about $3.6 billion for each cohort. Um, 
That's just one example of universal access. This is another example done in Sweden. We call it the Families United Promise. Uh, in seventh grade, every family was asked to watch at the uh, parent-teacher conference a simple little video PowerPoint presentation, about 20 minutes, and then asked to turn to their child and say, AJ, I don't want you to be, I don't want you to be drunk, stoned, high, or in trouble with the law, and I don't want your friends uh, Bruce and Marcos uh, to be drunk, stoned, high, or in trouble with the law. And all of us have parents have agreed that we're going to talk to each other if we think any of the kids are drunk, stoned, high, or in trouble with the law. Two years later, that reduced uh, binge drinking in the communities by about 24% and juvenile delinquency just under 30%. Now that, you get the how easy that is to do. And we just spent $24 million to do giant needs assessments in communities for risk and protective factors, and we got about a 3 and 2 percent respectively reduction in binge drinking and um, d delinquency. This is contagious. This can be done. Uh, prevention for everyone is available for every teacher. I'd like to introduce you to Muriel Sanders, who was a fifth grade, fourth grade teacher in Baldwin, Kansas in uh, 1967. She created this game called the Good Behavior Game. It was published as a study by um, Barry uh, Saunders and Montrose Wolf in 1969 in the Journal of Amer uh, Applied Behavior Analysis. This was the first study. She had the classroom from hell. They divided the class into teams. So the blue team and the red team. Oh, that could be the Bloods and the Crips. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, what they did is she described a thing if the teams made a foul or misbehavior within the course of a period of time, that was not a point against AJ, that was a point against the blue team or the red team, whichever it was. And if you, you, know, if you said your mama, you hit him, slugged him in the shoulder, that was two points against the team. And if this team said na 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 poo, <laughs> they got a spleen, we call them spleens now, got a spleen, they got two spleens, they got a spleen. Timer rings after it's set, you go about normal course of instruction, and then you have a simple activity prize uh, which is based on Premax principle of taking high rate behaviors and making those as the reinforcers for low rate behaviors, which was participation and engagement in the class and behaving. Uh, what that shows is a virtual immediate <coughs> reduction in disruptive, disturbing behavior in the classroom. That has been replicated so many times. I can go into any classroom. I can show you a video from eighth grade Baltimore, classroom from hell, and it is done in about six minutes that we've reduced, reduced that. And then this is a multiple baseline. This has now been replicated in 70 plus studies. Many interrupted show less disruption. Uh, three long-term gold standard studies, more, four more in progress that we have at Johns Hopkins. We have first grade follow-up to the 29th year of life in a randomized, it is the most elegant randomized study imaginable. It shows reductions in special ed, ADHD, bullying, conduct disorders, violent crime, suicide, tobacco, increased high school graduation, college entry. Uh, in progress, we have the measurements of reduction in obesity, teen pregnancy, STDs are also in process. I've got to stop. So I'm going to go here. Go ahead. Oh, I love what you're doing, so take what you need. We'll okay, uh, I'll go quickly. This is the Peace Builder study. Uh, which I've alluded to before. It had several active ingredients which we call evidence-based kernels, each with their own scientific evidence. These are positive notes homes. These are NCR papers that people were asked, every staff member was asked to note one child who made an improvement. Johnny Bad was less bad this week. Uh, Charles Blue Nose the Fourth was consistently good this week. So <laughs> <laughs> or Jane, or whatever it is. So every staff member was asked to do two of those. So if you had 50 staff, there were 50 notes. Those NCR, one went to the kid, one got posted up on the wall, one went down to the principal's office. And uh, every day, five, six different schools were asked to send five different names of kids to go to the local television station, Channel 13 here, and then they appeared on television, so KOLD, Channel 13 salutes these peace builders of the day in a 10 second bumper. Uh, these are peer to peer notes. These are students writing notes to one another for pro social uh, things and for helpfulness and social competence, etc. Uh, some of them times they're put in links like this and strung across the rooms. We did this in a school in South Central Los Angeles and it reduced gang behavior because we randomized 28 gangs to new gangs every month and they got special privileges as a consequence. 
Um, this is uh, the social competence data on the Walker McConnell, which is highly predictive. Uh, if you have high scores, it predicts desist lack of engagement in juvenile delinquency. Low scores predict engagement in juvenile delinquency. Within uh, several months, this is a randomized trial showing these are the increases in social competence. The effect size is about 0.56, if I remember. And this involves only four hours of in-service to teach teachers how to do this. It's a contagion. It's a viral contagion, how it's operated. This is the reductions in measured acts of violence. We use nurses' office records, coding them to, to, for illnesses and injuries. And we had a very large reduction in actual violent injuries. As far as I know, this may be the first study of children showing an actual prevention of violent injuries, not based on social things. This is a study that we have just submitted for publication in which at a community level we reinforced clerks and stores for not selling tobacco. And we brought the rates of illegal access down to record low levels to typically less than uh, around 5% of the time kids could buy tobacco at any given outlet in uh, two states, Wisconsin and Wyoming. I'm not showing you that graph. But this is the Youth Risk Behavior Survey on tobacco use. And what you see is this is 30 to any 30-day <coughs> use. You see reductions in Wyoming here, of substantially. All of this is statistically significant. This is Wisconsin. This is kids who smoked every day. Uh, you see a pretty big reduction. Now, we only have measures of this every other year. That's just the way the YRBS was done. This is uh, Wisconsin. They actually added a tax here of $1 per pack, so that actually inter intersected this. But this is actually, I, we think, the first study in the world to prevent a substance use in a controlled way across state boundaries. You know, this is grandmother's recipe. She told you to take cod, made you take cod liver oil years ago, and she was right. In a randomized trial, and this would be the policy example, uh, this is supplementation, but it can be achieved by other ways. This is a whole school district in the United Kingdom. Uh, where the kids were given uh, one full gram per day in gel caps of omega-3 fatty acid in a crossover design. And what you see here is a major reduction in um, uh, ADHD symptomatology for the fatty acids. This is increases in reading and spelling as a consequence, and that would be predicted. And let me go to the end here. So uh, I, these are all based on evidence-based kernels. We're also building a website that will make all of these kinds of things universally accessible to all families, teachers, and individuals so that you could do this kind of thing. We invite you to do this. We want to grow prevention science and policies as dandelions. <laughs> and if you want to change the world, you've got to leverage your change. You have to use this formula of reach, efficacy, adoption, implementation, and maintenance to achieve a population level. And here are my some of my potential truths. Culture determines biology. Biology determines culture. Culture is made up of antecedent practices, physiological practices, relational frame, language, reinforcement practices. Culture determines nurture. Nurture determines culture. Behavior can be predicted by contextual biology and social reinforcement. Big change is possible by using small things, and our grandmothers would have endorsed it. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, what do you want to do? Do you want to answer a few questions? Yeah, and we'll that's fine. Uh, yeah, that's video? fine. Okay, so, so just, just, just a time note. So, so we, we, we're going to need to give people lunch before too long. Do you so want to make a break at this point after a few questions? and then We can make a break. Why don't we give them a few questions, then why don't we go ahead, take a break, have lunch, and then we can see Tony's video. Okay. Okay. So the floor is open. Can uh, you quickly uh, explain a consumer model for uh, prevention science? You kind yeah. Of yeah, I had to go. I got the. <laughs> the hook. Uh, what we're building is a website that combines essentially iTunes, Amazon.com, YouTube, Facebook, a sort of United Way thermometer uh, in every household. So you would be able to go get these recipes just like you would buy on iTunes to use at home, at school, or in your workplace. So that now prevention science, uh, the Good Behavior Game has been published for 40 years. You, it, you can't get it. So we've been experimenting on how do you deliver the components of it, like Beat the Timer. Beat the Timer has 20 studies improving behavior in the classroom and uh, at home. Beat the Timer is actually an active ingredient of all the computer games. So we're going to make it available like that. We want then master's theses and other kinds of things, PhD things that are small units of change then to be converted to consumer product. 
that are inexpensive. Yes, sir. Like a number of your strategies are use an analogy uh, from evolutionary medicine, uh, you know, Pleistocene prescription. Yes. But you're talking about a social prescription that's based on understanding what the human mind has evolved to be sensitive to, particularly in the social and cultural context. And partly when this uh, session, you know, the workshop was getting organized, I was a little concerned about how this evolutionary logic is going to sell on Main Street, particularly in certain subcultural groups. I'm from Missouri. We have neighbors in Kansas and Arkansas and places like that that don't appreciate the logic of evolution all the time. Right. No, no. <laughs> we're, we're just this. We're, we have the same issue. Um, but I really like the way you sort of frame a lot of you know, uh, these packages. So the cons they're consumer friendly. Yep. They can understand why they work. Can you help us uh, sell evolution? Yes, I do every day. David has seen and Jerry have actually seen me do it. I mean, I tell people why African American peoples, and I have that dissent, why we have all of the health problems that we do is the result of an evolutionary bottleneck. Hmm. Lots of people died. Now, when we walk through all of these other things, I teach them when I, we teach uh, omega-3 fatty acids. I say, what did your grandma teach you to do? Well, that has, and if I'm in, in a biblical territory, what might I cite? Where do you think the Garden of Eden was? Eden, uh, Eden was. It was in the Rift Valley. And people didn't eat an apple, they ate a fish. Could I, let me make just a couple quick points about this. Uh, yeah. Uh, two, uh, two general, one, uh, one specific. One is, I'm so happy that mismatch theory has come up here. In a fully rounded evolutionary approach, there's an adaptive side, and we've learned the utility of the adaptive side this morning, the strategic reasoning, which is so compelling and so intuitive. Then there's the non-adaptive side, of which there's more than one variety, one of which is mismatch theory, the fact that if you take an organism adapted to one environment and you put it in another environment, all bets are off. That has a purely physiological component, as we've seen with diet. It also has a social component and a cultural component. So in many ways, we're fish out of water. And, and we're like, our adaptations are malfunctioning. We're broken organisms. And we have to, have, we have to pay just as attention, much attention to that as we do to, uh, to strategies working uh, properly. So uh, how wonderful is that? Then the point about uh, how can we make this appeal to people who are threatened and phobic about, ev about evolution, the answer is, your experience and mine, no problem, because when you have something like this, like, you know, add something to the diet and things get better, that's so compelling, and it's what your grandmother told you. Anyone's going to want to do that. They're not gonna, it's not going to bother them that you use the E word. Right. Now, finally, at a specific level, the fish hypothesis, I think, is problematic. And so this actually gets to some of the uncertainty that's associated yes. with the fact that our knowledge is not 100% knowledge. Correct. It doesn't actually make too much sense to me that um, all of this is based on fish diet, when in fact for many thousands of years, uh, all kinds of societies have not had a fish right. diet. And some of the most um, uh, recent uh, evidence that I know of says, actually, it's not fish, it's what animals are eating. Correct. And so, you know, now we associate it with fish because that's the only wild caught thing we eat nowadays. Yeah. But if you take terrestrial animals who eat a natural diet, they have a lot of C3s also. Yes. And that's so, so there's a sense in which the science is very uncertain, very provisional. Uh, and, so, but we, and so we need to cope with that uncertainty and you know, we need to improve the science as we're doing everything else. And actually, just to uh, add a coda on that, the issue is the ratio. Tissue is the issue, as Bill Lance would say, who is the scholar of all of this. Our tissue levels have gone way over the top. For example, the military service members have the highest tissue levels of omega-6 in their uh, bodies of anybody, and it's running, uh, their fatty acid ratio is about 88% omega-6. And um, the Japanese have virtually the exact reverse. Uh, but if then, we were all eating deer, then it might be... Yes, because, well, like the University of Wyoming has actually measured uh, animals that are wild eating what they were supposed to eat, and they have very high levels of omega-3 in their flesh. 
uh, fish is better in some ways, but uh, there are explanations for the discontinuity. So we don't need the Rift Valley hypothesis to, uh, to, no. to get this to work. No, but I, it's a nice storytelling. Okay. So <laughs> anyhow, yes. back to the groups. Yeah. Oh, and so, uh, Brief, do you want to just uh, maybe one or two more questions and then lunch? We could do a few more questions. I'm sure people have questions for Dennis. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll ask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, you know, presented to us a number of proven interventions that yep. have substantial and meaningful effects on child development. And at the same time, most, if not all, of those interventions were developed without an explicit adaptationist model. Evolutionary model, is that true? Um, Peace Builders was developed clearly with an evolutionary model in it. I just didn't speak it loudly because I knew the reviewers would go ape. So, <laughs> so, you know, so, so I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, what, can we use you know, you know, so so clearly we can do. You know, clearly a lot of interventions. That, there are many interventions out there. Yeah. Not just the ones you've mentioned. There's many oh, interventions. Yeah. No. Many of them have, you know, noticeable effects on kids. But almost all of them were developed without an evolutionary model. Can we use an evolutionary approach to make these interventions better, to extend them to other things, to adapt them? You know, what what is the you know what what really is the role that that as evolutionary theorists that, that we could do? in this context? Well, like David alluded to, for example, the um, it's about 250 years old, the notion of taking cod liver oil, which emerged from grandmother's daily observations. But more recently, the evolutionary science has informed us to look at that very carefully and how to look at that and to make sense out of it. But from behavioral interventions, um, I would say, for example, we could make a list of core essential issues in small uh, societies. So, for example, a, uh, developing a sense of identity that could grow so that you could embrace more and more people is clearly a useful intervention. And you want to reduce the perception of us versus them. Um, because the moment you set us versus them, then we engage all this differential cortisol, testosterone stuff flies off the charts with, uh, with your work, etc. Randomization and getting more and more people uh, involved in the thing so that you're mixing up and increasing the social competence seems to be an artifact of any number of explicit interventions with long-term follow-up that also sort of fits with some of the evolutionary um, theory. Making sure that there are developmental roles for every member of the, of the small society organization or whatever is manifest in uh, these smaller societies and wherever you sort of look with most of the interventions that also seems to be a component that was working. Now I think behavioral uh, approaches sort of fell into this because of their philosophical uh, relationship to selection by consequences which uh, uh, evolution is and so they've been closer to it. Um, and I think we could extract some, we could go, that's what the paper on evidence-based kernels was sort of about, was, a, was getting at the evolutionary comment. I don't know if I've answered your question entirely. Well, I was also kind of setting you up to talk about the adapted triple P. Oh, oh, I get now what you're asking me to do. Okay. What, um, nobody has gotten parent, got dads to participate. <coughs> it just doesn't happen in parenting programs. And, uh, we got several of our people here on our uh, team that wrote this application. But so one of the things we were looking at is what is it that dads do differently? Well, they do activity-based things with their children. They don't do child management. So if you run a course on parenting and say, we're going to get your child to be less bad, that is not attractive to a child, uh, to a parent, unless they're in desperation. But what we found, for example, is that dads uh, note that one of their most frequent activities and time spent with children is going shopping, which I hadn't thought about. But there are specific interventions that show uh, how to improve shopping uh, behaviors and make it more pleasant for the dad, and a whole host of things like rough and tumble play. Uh, I mean, you know, you know, if you talk to a group of women and you say you're going to get the guys to play rough and tumble play, all the most of the women shriek in horror. And but when you explain what it does, they go, "Oh, I never thought about it that way." So we want dads to engage in some kind of 
testing play that pushes kids up and then brings them down, et cetera. So I think there's a possibility of using that evolutionary information to design parenting practices for dads that would be very powerful. <coughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, just really quick. It seems to me like a lot of your behavioral interventions are um, are, are behavioral. And I'm, you're saying it's more because it's in alignment with evolutionary theory, but what I'm wondering is, are the behavioral strategies chosen because they're more evidence-based? Because it seems like a lot of the process that you are talking about is an evidence-based. And my work is a lot of research on how, right now, a lot of the evidence-based movement is based on behavioral strategies. Well, he here's my bias. This is my value. I ain't going to touch it unless I can test it and prove that it works. Because if I'm not, I'm not going to subject at a population level people to something that I don't know whether or not works. So as it happens, the things with the largest body of evidence right now are in fact behavioral. behavioral. Now there's emerging evidence like with the relational frame theory on how to change human behavior by language that's quite powerful. Um, that need, and then there's obviously these physiological and antecedent interventions which are extremely powerful, like organized games are not, I mean, yes, they've done, been done in behavioral studies, but they're really an antecedent. Right. Yeah. This issue has come up more than once, just now, and an early comment made by Jay. So, so we, have, we have, on the one hand, grandmother told you to do it for 200 years, and we have, on the other hand, science says it works, evidence-based stuff. What's the value added of evolution? I want to say there's a very considerable added value, and then there is a logic and a, and a motive to do something uh, when, you, when you have this, actually when you have any story, so this is back to your relational frame, but when you have a compelling story that's, been, that's, that's very large scale and, and so on, now you have kind of a reason to do it, a justification for, do it, for doing it, which was not the case with what grandmother told you to do, because right. that could have been an old wives tale. Right. And the fact that science says it works, and that's good as far as it goes, but it's just an isolated fact. It's just lying there with yeah. many other isolated facts. Now we have a narrative that puts it together. The narrative is now true in each and every detail. Witness the fish story, okay? Right. But it's the, it's the best narrative on earth, right? <laughs> yeah. So that, uh, so that uh, we certainly want that. Uh, uh, so I think that's this question of, what, what, what does this take us beyond what grandma told us to do and what science says is true? Can, can I riff off of just something that she, he said and just... Well, just well, let me, uh, okay. I, I want to riff too. But okay, you go <laughs> riff first. Your, your core. You know, so <laughs> Dennis, you know, Dennis and I actually just, you know, submitted a grant together to do a fathering intervention. And that's what, you know, that's what referring to. But, you know, the way that we used evolutionary theory in a very concrete way to advance intervention or attempt to advance intervention is that there's a proven parenting program which Dennis talked about, which is Triple P, uh, which is really about promoting positive parenting. It works very well with mothers, okay? Fathers generally don't participate. They don't sign up, they don't stay in it. So we, we thought, okay, evolution gives us a very powerful theory about fathering. It gives us a very powerful theory about when fathers will be engaged, when they will invest. And you can specify, it's about paternity confidence. It, 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 is, it is about being able to actually make a right. difference in children's fitness, and it is about trade-offs between parenting effort and mating effort. So you can specify three conditions, that when, <coughs> when fathers have high paternity confidence, when, there's, when, when context indicate that their actions will make, actually increase their offspring's fitness, and when, there is not, and when that parenting effort is not overwhelmed by trade-offs against mating effort, those are the context where you get fathering. So I said, okay, Let's use that to let's let's use that to recruit fathers. So one of the things that we're doing is simply using a classic social psychological manipulation to increase perceived similarity of fathers to their kids. Yeah. Because there's a whole yeah. literature that indicates that, that the more fathers perceive they're similar to their kids, the more they invest. And hey, social psychologists are brilliant in making people perceive greater or lesser psychological similarity. So the first thing we'll do is just give them some of these, do some of these social psychological manipulations to make them feel that they have more in common with their kids. Because we're assuming if we do that first, that then they'll be more likely to, de we'll, we'll get a foot in the door. They'll be more likely to, to uh, sign up for the program. And then, you know, thinking about, well, how do we adapt Triple P? Well, we adapt Triple P, you know, we're, we're doing a, 
you know, pilot studies to, to try to figure out what are the kinds of things that will motivate fathers to, fathers need, we need, we need to show fathers that they can actually make a difference right. in their kids' competitiveness and their kids' socio-competence and the kind of things that, that male investment, you know, should be important to. So we're just, I mean, right now, it's an exploratory process because we're interviewing fathers just yep. in the early stages of this. But, um, you know, it is a, you know, it is clearly, you know, you know, evolution has given us a theory about, about how to get fathers involved. Now, there's no guarantee that this is going to be successful. I mean, it's, it's a study. It's, it's, it's experiment. It's, it will ultimately culminate in an experimental trial. But we, you know, we, we you know, clearly have reason to believe it will. So, you know, it seems to me that, that many, many interventions that were developed without an evolutionary framework have the potential, you know, that are maybe serving some populations or are not serving others, that evolution might help you understand why they're working or why they're not working and might give you hypotheses about how to design them better to, uh, in that context. Well, we I have someone over here. Nasal spray should work too. Well, yeah. yeah, well, you know, there we go. I mean, yeah. I mean, right. yeah, I mean <laughs> these things, uh, whether we can do oxytocin nasal spray, I don't know. Well, so, I just wanted to follow up also on her <laughs> comment and yours just very briefly. That when Mark was talking about the moms or grandmas doing the little thing of, you know, what do you kids want and don't want, I think one of the ways that we need to be mindful is to use anthropological research uh, to identify putative candidates to be included in the armatoria. And so it was my observation of seeing something similar to what Mark <coughs> saw that in, uh, then brought us to try out a similar thing experimentally. And because I saw that seems to work, that's a powerful uh, sort of strategy. And I think we need to be very mindful, and that's also why the story I told about the teacher, because that was not invented by a scientist. It was invented by a teacher. And we sometimes forget this. Someone over here? And, and I just have a real quick comment. So yeah. I'm, I'm just an observer here, but one thing that I noticed about your presentation that kept sort of, the light bulbs kept coming off, and it felt really just so story-ish which is a huge criticism of our field. And so my only comment really is, is to really work at trying to make the evolutionary framework um, support what's going forward and, yes. and to minimize some of these stories. Well, wait that, a minute. That come across no. as stories. Uh, now, I, I, I get that there's, you know, people we have to engage them and make yes. them palatable. But, but one of the biggest criticisms of our field is that all we do are, are these just so stories. And, and it just makes me really nervous when we're at this really public interface to, to fall into some of those old trappings. Not that that's the way you operate, but that was a, an impression that I did get from the presentation. That, that's a very important point for you to raise. And so yeah. thank you for raising it. Yeah. I'm a little bit interested that, you, that uh, Dennis's talk uh, provoked that because it seemed to be very evidence-based. But... Uh, I think that we definitely do need to address that issue. How can we talk strategically? How can we talk about mismatch? Right. All this kind of stuff without, uh, without triggering that just so story uh, response. So thank you for raising it. I yep, am a little surprised that, that you felt that about Dennis's talk because it seems to me that there was. Um, it, it just seemed that the theories kept fitting with evidence and there wasn't sort of how Bruce said, here's the theory, here's what we would expect, here's the, the plan based on that. And theory wasn't driving the it actually did drive me. It drove yeah, but yeah. yeah, I understand that. Um, and and I, just to speak briefly to that, is you have, when you're meeting with a policymaker, three minutes. Okay? <laughs> yeah. So literally, the problem with scientists is we cannot make our story clear because the questions will come. Somebody, if you don't get them within the three minutes, you will never make a touchdown. Then begin to back it up steadily. And one of the things I'd like to do is to take my scientific colleagues through a sort of speaker's boot camp yeah. on how to do this persuasive communication. Because if you ask me to back up any single thing that was up on that slide, and you just ask me a question, when I was presenting that to a policymakers, I would be able to go, thank you very much, that's an excellent question, and let me show you, and what is your concern here exactly, and bang, to nail it down. But if I go into the long story beforehand, Sure, and yeah, I appreciate that, just as long as yeah. I And I'm a very good okay. salesman, so I know that, too. <laughs> <laughs> and I would just like to add briefly that 
Yes. I think um, maybe why you felt that way is that it was a mismatch hypothesis that you were presenting. And when we get into the mismatch, mm -hmm. that's um, a, a compelling alternative to some of the systematic processes we've been yes. thinking about. But there are so many ways in which we are currently mismatched to our environments that there are many different stories that we could use. Yes. And so I think that's where we get into um, maybe less um, solid ground there because there are so many different ways. Right. And you pursue um, one, which was the Rift Valley hypothesis, and there are many others. Um, and so maybe that's why we had that same reaction. Yeah. So yeah. It wasn't I'm, I'm in a technical group here of like no one would ever question me outside of this room about the rift hypothesis. I mean, I'd have to be in a group of... <laughs> There's another step, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just, it would be, um, I, I would fall dead uh, from uh, things, but yeah, that's great. The added value of evolutionary uh, uh, science on culture is that cultures mm. tell stories. Yes. And if we're going to have effective interventions, we need to know what those stories are as well. I just wanted to add that point. Yes. <laughs> I think yes. Go ahead, Adrian. Uh, one more thing that uh, this is kind of delayed, but uh, I think it, it, it fits into the value added thing. Um, why is it that, aside the things that you're drawing <laughs> from what appears to be traditional social science, are behavioral? Okay. And I think that it, 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 it's worth emphasizing that it's always selection by consequences. Through yep. and through, the thread that I saw through your entire presentation is selection by consequences. And one of the things that evolutionists do that really separates us from a lot of the other traditional fields, but not from behaviorism, is that we ask, what is the function of that? Every single speaker here has always asked, in terms of why somebody is doing something, not what's wrong with them, but what is the function <coughs> of that? And these behavioral manipulations address manipulating the payoffs, manipulating the contingencies, whether we're talking about natural selection or we're talking about operant conditioning, there is a coherent set of ways of thinking and a functionalist framework that all these things do have a great deal of coherence in my view, you know, uh, as far as being, paying attention to the consequences of behavior. Yep. Yeah. So, so uh, final uh, check out one over there. Uh, final question. Well, uh, I just want to push back a little, but there are differences between evolutionary theory and behaviorism that yep. are rather profound. So, so there's overlap, but there is an intent of understanding, as I understand in evolutionary theory, that is totally absent in any behaviorist spin mm -hmm. on it. And that, and, and that, that added in that value added is that intent of understanding that you, we are bringing that in behaviorism is cut off completely, that's ignored, right. it is just stimulus response and the yeah. story. Well, I'm not saying it's sufficient. I'm right. just saying that there are yeah. common elements. And just as we always like, just as a social psychologist would predict, in talking about how special we are and how the other guys are yeah. bad, yeah. we have to realize when there's commonalities yeah. and when we can right. integrate with existing yeah. I want to yeah. I wanted to finish up by saying that the integration of, of evolutionary psychology and the behaviorist tradition is something that's only happening just now. Yep. And there's a baby and a bathwater in both of those traditions. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as narrow school evolutionary psychology is concerned, behaviorism went out with the SSSM. Mm -hmm. And as far as behaviorism is concerned, there's not the appreciation of innateness, which is in evolutionary psychology. Now we have, we're putting them together now, but only now. It's like culture. Yeah. So, so much is happening just now as far as the basic science is concerned. And yet we don't want to wait five or ten years before we apply that to the real world. So that's part of the positive trade-off between basic science and applications, which, we, which is also a theme. Yeah. So let's have lunch. Yep. Yeah, let's so, do it. So let's do... Um, 93 uh, because, okay, so, so we don't have a long lunch break today. Um, 